When in Glasgow, I stay at the Premier Inn on Pacific Quay, primarily because the King won't allow me to sleep in his orangery, and if you ask nicely at reception, they allocate you a room overlooking the Clyde. Who doesn't wish to awake to such a view? Apart from idiot moon landing believers, Tarquin claims. The rooms could do with refurbishing though, as they're a little tired. After unpacking, it was past 3pm, so I hurried along to Govan Cross to shoot Andrew Brown's Mary Barber sculpture. In 1915, Mary Barber, the Govan-based campaigner, led months of protest over rent rises which culminated in large demonstrations outside Glasgow Sheriff Court and the city chambers. The protests resulted in Munitions Minister Lloyd George changing the law to reduce rents to pre-war levels across the UK. Designed by sculptor Andrew Brown, the sculpture shows Barber marching with members of the community behind her. Across the road is sighted the Aitken Memorial Fountain, fabricated in 1884 by Cruikshank & Co in their Denny foundry. The fountain is dedicated to the memory of John Aitken, a governed doctor, legend has it, died from overwork due to his dedication serving the area's poor. However, Aitken was a mason, and you believe masons at your peril, Tarquin points out. 2011 saw the fountain restored at a cost of £39,000. The primer failed, allowing rust to develop, so the monument was dismantled and transported to a conservatoire, where it was stripped down, repainted and restored to Govan Cross in 2014. Behind the Aitken Memorial docks the Glen Lee tall ship. This 75 metre steel hulled bark was constructed at the base shipyard Port Glasgow by Anderson, Roger and Company and launched in December 1896. After sailing to Liverpool to load with general cargo, her maiden voyage was to Portland, Oregon. In 1990 the ship was discovered awaiting scrappage in Spain and in 1993 was bought at auction by the Clyde Maritime Trust for £40,000, subsequently being towed back to Glasgow. Extensive work returned the Glen Lee to its original condition, and since 2011 it has been an attraction at Glasgow's Riverside Museum. Keeping on a nautical theme, Bella Houston Park was the next destination for a look at Jimmy Cosgrove's Homies to Glasgow shipbuilding sculpture. Former Glasgow School of Art student Jimmy Cosgrove's designs were fabricated by Hector McGarva in cast iron and corten steel, or weathered steel. The Angel of the North in Gates Head is also formed of corten steel. To the side of the ship worker and his dog sits a table covered with the worker's tools, hammer, pincers, punch, etc. The sculpture was installed in October 2005 and is situated not far from the house for an art lover. Thursday evening I wandered into town about 9pm. I like shooting at night, there's a satisfaction in finding a suitable camera perch and taking a long exposure, producing an almost noise free photograph. While out, I stumbled upon an enduring favourite, painted brick signs. These were on Trongate. And of course, grimy alleys always appeal. This morning's destination was Gorbals. The joy of issuing transport and walking everywhere are your encounters on the way, and the first encounter was the former Cumberland Street railway station. Built in 1900 by Glasgow and South Western Railway, this red sandstone structure replaced Main Street station Gorbals, following the track doubling from Port Eglinton to St Enoch station. Operations continued until 1966 when passenger services to St Enoch ceased. The building was listed Category B in August 2004 and in 2012 sealed with concrete blocks. No doubt this sealing won't prevent the building going on fire if needs be. A hop, skip and jump away is the Caledonia Road Free Church where the North End's well-spaced symmetrical entrances on an unadorned wall enamoured me. Even more so when rounding the corner revealed the symmetry replicated on the church's west wing. 
As my mentor commentated on Twitter, this 1865 structure belongs to the pen of Alexander Greek Thompson. And surprise, surprise, it went on fire in 1965. A listed building in Glasgow going on fire? Surely not. Continuing eastwards, I reached my destination, Liz Pedden's Gorbals Boys sculpture. Gorbals Boys is sited in the corner of Cumberland Street in Queen Elizabeth Gardens. The work by local artist Liz Peden is a recreation of an iconic 1963 Oscar Mazzaroli photo, depicting three small boys playing in their mother's high heeled shoes. Peden modelled the boys on three pupils attending the nearby St Francis Primary School. The £40,000 bronze and chrome sculpture was unveiled in 2008. Cemeteries, like bandstands, are places of wonder and draw me in. The Southern Necropolis was opened in 1840 with the intention of providing dignified and affordable burials for all. It consists of three sections. Central section, opened in 1840, Eastern section, opened in 1846, and the 1850 opened Western section. The gatehouse, designed by Charles Wilson, was built in 1848. The necropolis's semi-dilapidated state holds great appeal, and I spent a pleasurable hour wandering about in the sunshine. Overlooking the necropolis is the 24-storey, 69-metre-high, 305 Caledonia Road tower block. One cemetery is never enough, so I ambled north towards Glasgow Necropolis, which I covered in Glasgow Wandering 3, to look over the city. Hunger was setting in, necessitating a supermarket stop on the way back to the hotel. As you can see, I favour a fruit and salad diet. After dark I wanted to take a few shots of Kelvinside Hillhead Parish Church. Gothic architecture is best avoided, and this 1876 constructed James Seller design is based on the Gothic Saint-Chapelle Church in Paris. But I'm a sucker for curved walls. Unfortunately rain arrived, which curtailed shooting, as Sony cameras are not keen on moisture. The church's location allowed me to walk by his road, amused at Partick self-worth and pretentiousness. This doesn't mean I dislike Partick, even if it does need to get over itself, but everyone knows real men favour Paisley Road West. A sunny start to the day suggested a long overdue visit to the Botanic Gardens on Great Western Road. Kibble Palace was designed by John Boucher and James Coosland for John Kibble's Coolport home and was originally called the Kibble Crystal Art Palace. In 1871, Kibble entered negotiations for the palace to be dismantled and transported by barge to Glasgow, where it was reconstructed in 1873. The reconstruction included a new dome 46 metres in diameter and extension of the transepts, creating a grand and substantial Victorian glass house. With the sun still in appearance, I decided a northward stroll along the River Kelvin walkway was in order. Riverside walks are a great favourite, not least because you'll encounter bridges, and bridges are things of beauty, like Kirk Lee Bridge. Constructed between 1899 and 1900, this red sandstone span closely follows plans of Scottish architect Robert Milne's 1760s Blackfriars Bridge in London, which was demolished in 1864. Unfortunately, polished granite was chosen for the ionic abutment columns. Polished granite is the devil's work, and Tarquin maintains was probably chosen by an idiot BBC believer. Further along the walkway, I stumbled upon Winford Flats in Mary Hill. To my eyes, these flats were two massive sculptures placed in a field and had an air of mainland Europe, possibly France. Their situation and bearing pleased me to such an extent I nearly smiled. Like most men, I can't bear retracing my steps and decided to keep following the footpath until I found a bridge to cross and then head back into town on the opposite side of the river. 
After finding my way through the west of Scotland Science Park, I came upon this beautiful stone bridge to cross and walked alongside the river only to find the footpath closed to art gallery ponces. Well, it was due to mud, so I had to retrace my steps a few hundred yards and find a route to Bearsden Road. First job of the evening was to purchase tickets at Queen Street Station for tomorrow's mystery location shoot. Luckily, a young lady took pity on me and helped me operate the ticket machine, or I'd still be there now, with a bemused look on my face. Tickets purchased, I wished to check on the coolest livery font in Glasgow, Variety Bar, Socky Hall Street. The livery is still there, sadly the bar hasn't reopened. Socky Hall Street was the quietest I've known it on a Saturday evening. People's taste for nightlife seems to have shifted away from the earthy Socky Hall Street to areas around Royal Exchange Square. When you punch around with a camera people often speak to you, and later in the evening I fell into conversation with a gent while passing the Mitchell Library, who insisted on buying me a drink in his local, the Avalon Bar on Kent Road. We call it the Stabalon, but you'll be alright with me, he said. Unfortunately time was against me and I needed to be bright eyed and bushy tailed for Sunday's mystery destination, so I declined his kind invitation. Making my way to Queen Street Station I inadvertently entered Buchanan Street. I usually avoid this capitalist pig dog hellhole, but solace can be found in most things. In this case it was the Art Deco entrance of Rowan House. Settled on the train, it was off to Falkirk, and if that's not a mystery destination, I don't know where it is. To shoot around town with a Falkirk genius. Hello Andrew. I intend to make a standalone Falkirk video of our day, so I won't go in depth here. That used to be the bar, that used to be the Argyle bar. I spent a very long time waiting in there for somebody to or some I can't put that in the video. You can't? No, I can't. Our ramble over, we return to Andy's for lunch, where he and his wife Toots live in a Victorian villa with more period detailing than you can shake a stick at. I stepped through the front door to be met with an original tiled floor, and immediately asked if they wanted a lodger. They didn't. Well, not of the art gallery ponce variety. Lunch was an alfresco delight of Andy's creation, consisting of meatballs on a bed of pea shoots, roasted peppers, roasted courgettes with feta cheese, hummus and homemade ciabatta bread. The meal over we caught up and discussed ideas for a three part video we're working on. Actually, Andy's working on it. I'm offering encouragement and bad advice. All too soon it was time to catch the train back to God's own city, where the king, if he is to be believed, had visited church and tended to his roses. That evening I stumbled upon the beautifully grimy and forgotten entrance to the former Stuart and McDonald's limited department store, now House of Fraser, at the southern end of Mitchell Street, an excellent location for the cinematically creative. The building, which also faces onto Argyle and Buchanan Streets, was rebuilt to the designs of Horatio Bromhead and was completed in 1903. Bromhead was also responsible for the Haldane building on the corner of Hill Street and Rose Street. The morning was spent lazily shooting photos in Govan, waiting for a text from the King to say he was free for our road trip. Passing through Elder Park, a gent walking his dog issued a cheery Morning! Followed by a laconic Lovely day! It was pissing down with rain, which amused me. I love these little social interactions. Shortly afterwards the Scottish Sun asked if they could use a photo I tweeted following a man being attacked outside Goma the previous evening. Normally I would say no, but I knew allowing the photo's use would annoy the King, and annoying him is one of life's little pleasures. The King texted to say he would meet me on Trongate at 1.45pm. I went back to the hotel, picked up some equipment and walked east along the north bank of the Clyde to Trongate. 
This route allowed me to check on the progress of 286 Clyde Street, which was cruelly demolished after standing empty for some time and then going on fire to make way for some no doubt hideous capitalist pig dog structure. What I found was little obvious headway since my visit 12 months ago. The King arrived and we nipped to the Clutha Bar on Stockwell Street with the intention of deciding a route, but instead discussed everything bar the project in hand. This channel is a shambles. After a drive round town covered in the Glasgow driving with the King of Glasgow, video linked below, we headed for Greenock to see the much delayed ferry being constructed in the Ferguson shipyard Port Glasgow. This is the second of two ferries being built since the shipyard was rescued by a supposed billionaire who lives in Monaco. The first, which isn't finished either, is away being repaired elsewhere. They were supposed to be sailing to the Scottish Islands several years ago, the result of a £97 million contract, but the billionaire, the Scottish Government and the state-owned ferry company couldn't agree the design and it all turned to custard. The shipyard went bust and the government took over. Now the costs have trebled to nearly £300 million and they can't agree exactly whose fault that is. Adjacent to the Ferguson shipyard is Newark Castle. The four-storey tower and gatehouse were built around 1478 by George Maxwell, with connecting range added by descendant Patrick Maxwell between 1597 and 1599. Port Glasgow was originally known as Newark, hence the castle's name with a change occurring when a different Patrick Maxwell from the aforementioned sold land to the city of Glasgow for the port to be built in 1668. Greenock is the setting for the dourly excellent 1979 Just a Boys Game, one of the 300 plus dramas produced by the BBC during their Play for Today series, which ran from 1970 to 1984. Both the King and I highly recommend Just a Boys Game. There's a link below. McCafferty, your tease out. We made our way back to Glasgow where the King bought me what he called dinner. But if you're from solid working class stock like me, it's called tea in the Darbar Indian restaurant on Candle Rigs. Uh, I know the title is Five Days in Glasgow, but never mind. Tuesday was travelling home, leaving Central Station in the morning, and you can never see enough of Central Station. The real reason for the sixth day though, is to show this footage of approaching Newcastle Station from the south. Crossing the Tyne is my favourite approach to any station in the UK. Magnificent. This video would not have been possible, nor my trip nearly as enjoyable, without Andy and the King's unending kindness. Thank you very much, you are gods.